Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, well, we got an interesting uh, discussion uh, tonight, and that is how to uh, have a good divorce, uh, if that's at all possible. And joining us to chat about that is Heather Tannenbaum. Heather Tannenbaum is the author of a book called Reconstructing Happy, How to Use Your Divorce as an Opportunity to Build a Better You. And, uh, and she's a certified divorce coach. And so it'll be interesting to see what she has to say. Heather, welcome to our show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. How did you become a divorce coach? Well, I went through my own divorce and I, um, it's funny because I do everything kind of backwards. So I wrote the book before I became a divorce coach and I wrote the book, not really for the purpose of publishing it, which ended up being the final result, but I wrote it more as a therapeutic process for me. I was the primary caregiver of my two young children who were seven and nine at the time. And when they started to spend, you know, one night a week and every other weekend with their dad, I was at a loss of what to do. And so I am a writer. And so I wrote down my thoughts, my feelings. It was more of a journal for me. And I found that you know, through the process of writing it, what evolved was something along the lines of not so much self-help, but I guess it would fall into the self-help category. Uh, and I thought that it might actually be useful for other people. So after many edits to transform it from a journal to something that would be of value to other people and getting uh, contributions from family law lawyers, divorce financial analysts, and other professionals in the industry, my book was born. And from that, it kind of evolved. I was promoting my book to a family law lawyer, actually. And she said, you'd be an amazing divorce coach. And I said, oh, thank you. But like, what is that? And so then the, the Google searches began frantically and I um, found out what a certified divorce coach does and how to get certified. And I hopped right on that train and did it. Fantastic. Sounds fun. So reconstructing happy. How do you use your divorce as an opportunity to build a better you? Mm -hmm. Explain, how do you uh, reconstruct happy? Well, none of us get married thinking that one day we're going to get divorced. But as you know, the statistics would suggest that many of us end up taking that route, whether we the, want. What is it now, like 57% or something like that? Something like that. I wouldn't, don't quote me on numbers. I'm certainly not a numbers girl. <laughs> Um, but it is a very high percentage. And while we may not get the happily ever after that we wanted, doesn't mean that there isn't another happily ever after out there, but it's not just going to fall on our lap. It's up to us and it's incumbent upon all of us to create it. If you want something, figure out how to create it, build it for yourself. Just because your first version of happy didn't work out you know what, you have an opportunity, sort of like Humpty Dumpty. You can pick up the pieces you want, discard the ones that you don't, and learn more about yourself. This is also, you can use your divorce as a self-discovery journey to figure out what you don't want, what you do want, and what you want the next number of years of your life to look like. So that is how you can create a better you. I mean, it's it's the old it's the old saying: make lemons out of lemon, make lemonade out of lemons. It's using your divorce. Nobody wants to get divorced. Nobody sets out with that intention. But here we are, many of us, and it's a not a fun process. But if you allow yourself to grow from it and learn from it and do the work, you can recreate the future you want. And uh, how did you find uh, how did you find your way to this better happy, this reconstructing happy? It started by really taking a long, hard look at my responsibility in the breakdown of my own marriage. It's always very easy to blame the other person, to be angry, but it takes two. Two people got married, two people get divorced. There's always a part that you play, whether it's a large part, not a large part, it doesn't even matter. But once you can reflect on that and understand and take ownership for what your part in the destruction or dissolution of your marriage was, you can go back and start to forgive yourself and possibly forgive your spouse, depending on the situation. But forgiveness is always the better route. And from that comes healing. And once you're able to heal, you're able to move forward. So you had to take responsibility for your own part in the divorce. Were you mm -hmm. responsible? Well, in part, I suppose I was in the, I mean, I was, I was married to a family law lawyer. 
So I was married for over 14 years to a dedicated professional to his field. And with that type of profession comes a lot of hours. And I was really the one who did a lot, most of the um, child raising and took care of everything around the home. Um, I think that my part in my divorce had to do with the fact that I stopped talking to my husband. I stopped communicating with him about things that I wanted, things that I felt. Uh, I stopped, you know, really just communicating about the important stuff. It was more about uh, our daughter has a doctor's appointment, our son has this, and, and it became more logistics. And, you know, I, through time, I didn't really make my marriage a priority. I made my kids a priority, but I never really took the time to make my marriage a priority. And what about your spouse? Did he make your marriage a priority? You'd have to ask him. Okay. So, so number one is, um, is analyzing and taking some responsibility uh, for your own part. Um, do you think most people do that or do most people blame their spouse? It's always easy to blame someone else. And in the, the early stages of divorce, there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of anger. And whether you're the person who asked for the divorce or you're the person who was asked for the divorce, um, there's different feelings that go along with that. There can be guilt, there can be hurt, there can be fear. There's a lot of fear and about the unknown. There's fear about uh, what your finances are going to look like. There's fear about what your, your mutual friends are going to say. There's fear about everything. I remember in the early days when we had first separated, I actually sat in my car at the parking lot at Walmart and I, would, I, I didn't want to get out of the car for fear that somebody would say, oh, Heather, How's it going? Well, I, how do I answer that? Do I, do I tell them? Do I not? Do they know? Do they not? There was a lot of fear. And it, it, was, it was from a place of insecurity. It was from a place I didn't know where my life was, was going. I didn't know where all the pieces were going to fall. And that's a very, very common theme amongst a lot of my clients as well. There's the fear of the unknown, which is natural. Yeah. So... Um... Number one is figuring out your own responsibility. Number two is just getting over the fear of unknown. Um, and, uh, and I guess in your case, it was not being so embarrassed about it in public and having to uh, confront people. And I guess uh, um, what, you just have to get over that and get on with life? Pretty much, yeah. You have to get on with life and how people think the situation people are going to talk people love to talk but you have to shut out the noise you need to stay focused and of course it's easier said than done focus on you focus on what you need focus on what you need for your family what your children need from you and and keep it more focused more laser focused the noise will drown out the important stuff if you let it we're chatting uh, tonight about divorce and uh, a divorce coach. We've got Heather Tannenbaum with us, who is a divorce coach, and she's the author of a book about reconstructing happy. Um, we're going to take a, a break and come back more uh, with Heather in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour in Second and Sixty. We're chatting tonight with Heather Tannenbaum. She is a divorce coach. Um, and it'll be interesting. We'll talk a little bit about what a divorce coach is and, and how one can help you. But she's written an interesting book called Reconstructing Happy, which is all about um, how to get over the, the divorce. And uh, you say, Heather, in, uh, in your website um, to uh, the, uh, the book that your first part of it uh, tells your story in the early days of your separation and how you would turn to bookshelves to try and find support. Um, tell me a little bit about your separation and uh, how you dealt with uh, the, the, was it the divorce a surprise? The separation a surprise? Um, the divorce was not so much a surprise. There had obviously been conversations and things leading up to our, our decision to separate um, and to divorce. Um, but for me, it was difficult for many reasons. One, I was a stay at home mom. I was raising my daughter who was nine at the time and my son who was seven at the time. Um, I was fortunate enough to not 
have to work. My a second income was not required at that time. And so really my life was one where I focused completely around my children and probably looking back on it, I can tell you, well, not probably, definitely looking back on it, I can tell you I actually lost my own identity. I became their mom and someone's wife. And I forgot who Heather was. And it didn't even seem as important because I was this girl's mom and that boy's mom and, and this kid's mom's volunteering at school. And I did the lunch program. And so I, I was very fortunate to be so entrenched in my kids' lives. And then when I went through my divorce, all of a sudden, what do you mean I have to share my time? What do you mean parenting time with someone else? I'm used to taking care of my kids. So now all of a sudden there was that, which led to uh, actually some separation anxiety on my part from being separated from my kids. It was not an easy transition for me. I knew they were with their dad. I knew they were well cared for. I knew he loved them and I wasn't concerned about their, their, their safety. But for me, it, I was so accustomed to doing that. And, and with the loss of my own identity, I had to figure out like, who am I when I'm not their mom? And when so how, I'm do you, not how, do you, wife. how do you do that? Like, did you go to a therapist? Did you go to meditation? Did you go on an eat, pray, love tour of, of India? I should have, I should have done all of the above, but what I did instead, well, I did, I did actually uh, see a therapist, uh, but that is actually how my book was born was because I would, sit at my desk and I would write and I would type and I would write and I would just get my feelings out. And my feelings are not, I mean, there's some of that in the book, but there were certain things, you know, with a lot of our feelings and our thoughts at the time when we're in the moment, they weren't necessarily fair. They weren't necessarily rational. I knew they needed to spend time with their dad. I would never prevent them from doing that. But at the time in my head, it wasn't fair. I didn't want to give up my kids. I didn't look at it for the bigger picture. And I had to write through that. Other people, you know, find their comfort in other ways. They, they join groups, they speak to friends, they hire incredibly talented certified divorce coaches like myself, but people, <laughs> people um, find their own way. Mine was through writing and that's kind of how my book was born. So it's interesting, I, you know, we were talking about what the statistics are, and I haven't found the statistic of how many people in total uh, divorce, but- uh, I know it's gone up significantly in Ontario um, post-pandemic or during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Was... We, uh, you should, we should look at it. But according to some data that uh, I found about, um, you know, 10%, uh, you know, back a couple of years ago and, and about 6% today of all divorces every year fail. Um, and that's about uh, half of what it would be in the United States. But that's a lot of divorces every year. It's not such an uplifting statistic, is it? Of, you know, somewhere between six and 10 in Canada and 20% in the United States of all divorces every year fail? Marriage is failing, yeah. If, if, if the number of 57% total is right, then that's got to mean that the probability of second and third divorces is really low. Uh, and I think uh, second divorces is actually higher than first divorces. If yeah, I, one would think that's got to be the case. Yeah. So, so you 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 find happiness. Um, you figure out who you are, and you did that. You said through therapy and writing a journal, the journal that became a book. Um, what do you recommend to other people? Same thing, or or the pray love uh, tour of India? It can all work. Um, I would recommend that everybody really take a long hard look at themselves you have to get to know who you are and if your situation was similar to mine and that you kind of lost yourself and your kids and your spouse take some time figure out who you are I know a lot of people as soon as they um, separate they get on these dating websites and they frantically start swiping right or left or whatever it is that you're supposed to swipe um, and that's okay but it, but remember to just take time to figure out who you are, because until you actually know who you are and what you like, it might not be the same as it was before you had kids. We all evolve over time. And taking that time to figure out what makes you tick is going to help you when you kind of do dive into the dating pool and find someone else. If you don't love yourself and if you don't accept yourself and you 
To do that, you have to know who you are. How can you possibly accept, expect somebody else to? That's interesting because, you know, my, my experience or my sense, um, not based on any kind of, uh, of academic or uh, theoretical uh, research, but just based on, uh, you know, casual conversation, is the vast majority of people blame their former spouse and don't take responsibility and don't think about um, themselves and, and, and what their self-image is and how that self-image or that, um, you know, definition of who they are needs to change. They all just blame the spouse. It was her fault or his fault. Well, hard work is hard. So not everybody can do it. Not everybody is prepared to do it. Um, and when I say not everybody can do it, I mean, they, they choose not to. Sometimes it's difficult. We have to really look at ourselves in a light that might not always be all that flattering. But for me, and just in my personal opinion, it's so important that we do that. Because if we can't figure out what our patterns were and where we may have you know, done things differently, how do we prevent ourselves from repeating the same patterns? No question. So, so does a divorce co coach help one re refine happiness? Uh, I would like to think that I help some of my clients with that. Um, a lot of my clients come to me um, and I help them with strategies and how to disengage with an angry ex partner, how to not allow, um, you know, negative talk to seep into their minds, how to really just build up their own self-esteem, their self-confidence. And one of the biggest things that I do is I help my clients to take the emotion out of the um, decision-making process. It always sounds silly when I say take the emotion out of divorce, because from my own personal experience, I cannot think of a time in my life that was more emotional yeah. than when I went through my divorce. But there's a, there's a place for emotion, but it doesn't come in the form of decision-making. You can never make sound decisions when it comes from a place of emotion. And that emotion can be fear. That emotion can be guilt. That emotion could be sadness. It could be anything. So if, for example, you were the one who um, was caught cheating on your spouse and your spouse kicked you out, you might feel a lot of guilt, but decisions can't come from that place. So a person like that would have to do a lot of self-reflection, figure out why they made the choices they made, figure out you know, how to forgive themselves and how to move forward. I have a, a friend who uh, has an extremely litigious uh, ex-spouse uh, who has a lot of emotion in uh, their litigious attitude. How do you deal with that? Um, they're angry. Their spouse is angry. Yeah. A lot of times, and it's very difficult, but I work with my clients on, on understanding that you can only control what you can control. You can't control what your spouse does. You will never be able to control what your spouse or your ex-spouse does, what they say, what they think, what they feel. But you can control how you react to it. So if your friend were to get an upsetting, aggressively worded email from their ex-spouse, that could be really, really upsetting. And they may want to hit that reply button and frantically type away until their keyboard is so hot it's about to flame up. But I always encourage my clients to employ the 24-hour rule. Unless it's a time-sensitive matter, you don't have to respond right away. You should take 24 hours, calm down, reread it again, let the emotions settle down before you engage in any type of response. And by the way, sometimes no response is a response. How do you deal with, uh, or is there any way to deal with uh, excessive litigation? <laughs> um, unfortunately, if somebody wants to litigate, you have to take part in that process. Um, part of the key to managing your legal costs, let's say, is to find a lawyer who is a good fit for you. There's like, I, I equate it to my clients when I'm referring them to a family law lawyer, which by the way, I encourage all my clients to hire a family law lawyer. Um, a lawyer is there to advise you on your rights and your obligations as it pertains to the law. And I think that there's a very, very important aspect 
to any divorce that requires legal services. So where people say a lawyer is so expensive, a lawyer is so expensive, but how you use that lawyer is going to be paramount to how much you're spending in legal fees. And that's one of the things I help my clients with. I help them become more efficient and effective clients to their lawyers. So I can help them before they're meeting with their lawyer to hone in on what the questions are, what the issues are, and come up with an agenda. A service that I've actually started providing just over the pandemic, which I will certainly continue because there's certainly been value to it, is liaising with my clients and their lawyers on phone calls. So we will do a conference call when they speak with their lawyer. I take notes for the client because I've always encouraged before the pandemic, I would tell them to take a family member or a friend or someone to the meeting with them because you can't absorb all the information. And no matter how sophisticated and well-versed you are, you will leave your lawyer's office with your head spinning. So you need somebody there who's not emotionally invested in it. But I've been serving that role for my clients, but I'm able to ask questions because I can't give legal advice. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I can help my clients to hone in on what exactly the issues are that they should be asking their lawyer. And it saves a whole lot of time. Like what? Give me an example of a question that wouldn't uh, typically be something that the client would ask, but that you would come up with. I had a client who wanted sole custody of her kids and wanted to retain the right to move back to her hometown of Nova Scotia. And they were in Ontario. And she was, she didn't quite know. She was so anxious and so upset. She wasn't quite articulating to the lawyer what she was asking. And so I interjected in the phone call as I often do. And I said, I believe what she's asking is if you could please explain um, mobility issues when it comes to um, decision making and when it comes to parenting time and how that would look and is she allowed to actually move back and how would that look if she tried to and so I honed in on exactly what she was trying to ask of the lawyer and now the lawyer clicked oh, okay I need to talk about I need to talk about decision making I need to talk about parenting time so I can use the terms that the lawyers are familiar with that the client might not be, but I'm not giving legal advice. I'm right. helping the client obtain the legal advice that they're looking for. What about um, mediation versus uh, litigation? Do you recommend it? I, I do. I Litigation should always, always, always be a last resort. Um, litigation is never a first step and, and the courts are designed in that way. Today, the family court is designed in such a way that they want you to settle out of court. Mediation is an extremely effective um, alternative dispute resolution. And I have many clients who work su successfully with that process. What is a case conference? Uh, so I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that a case conference would be step one of the litigation process. So nothing can actually get done in the legal system in Ontario, as far as I know, without a case conference going first. I would, that, that's also my understanding. And then I was surprised. I thought that, you know, really initiating litigation should come after that case conference occurs. But I heard that this person actually had a case conference uh, coming up in several months, but the motion date was set for like uh, two weeks after the first case conference, um, months before it even occurred, which you sort of wonder so why the heck I, 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 that does conference? happen. That does happen, but I, I I'm reluctant to talk about that process because I'm not a lawyer. So it could be you you and I chit chatting about this over drinks. I'd be happy to do, but I, I wouldn't want any of your uh, listeners or viewers to mistake what I say as actual fact in this situation because if we're talking about divorce coaching i can deem myself an expert when we're talking about the law i certainly am not okay well that's very prudent to answer what about arbitration do you uh, recommend uh, if if mediation is good uh, better than litigation is arbitration better than litigation anything's better than litigation unless of course it's a situation where the only way you're going to resolve it is to leave it to a judge we're chatting and today. oftentimes that happens. People are often at such an impasse that the litig I mean, the litigation process is necessary in many cases. And I can work with my clients on how to manage their emotions around that. I can help them to get ready for their court appearances by telling them, you know, what to expect, 
um, and things like that. And we, I work with the lawyers on that. And oftentimes the lawyer will say to me, can you not with me on the phone, but can you go over with the client A, B, C, and D so that they're better prepared? And I'm very happy to work with the lawyer in that regard as well. We're chatting tonight with Heather uh, Tenenbaum. She is a divorce coach uh, and she's the author of a book, Reconstructing Happy, How to Use Your Divorce as an Opportunity to Build a Better You. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more. And I'm going to ask uh, Heather a little bit more about, uh, you know, what a divorce coach does. Um, why do people need it? Uh, you know, how do they work with other people, uh, et cetera. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Heather Tenenbaum. She is a divorce coach and uh, she is the author of Reconstructing Happy, How to Use Your Divorce as an Opportunity to Build a Better You. Sounds like a great idea, building a better you. Um, most people wouldn't have thought it as the, as a divorce that had to be the catalyst to build a better you. Um, but hey, you know what? I guess what... What doesn't kill you makes us stronger is the old adage. And so therefore, I guess going through some, uh, some, uh, some crap sometimes is a, is a good way to figure out the way forward. Um, and uh, I, can, I can only hope that for the people that we know that uh, are going through or have gone through divorces. But let's, um, before we actually talk about divorce coach, I wanted to just uh, let you know about a statistic that, uh, that I found, um, because Canada is not as bad as we were talking about. According to the Toronto uh, Sun, Canada had the 29th highest divorce rate uh, in the world um, of 32%. Russia came in first highest with 65%. And it's interesting, the U.S. has got that number that we were talking about, about 53%. So about 53% of all divorces in the United States uh, end in divorce. Uh, and in Canada, it's somewhere around uh, 30, 32, 33%. Um, so a third of all divorces in Canada uh, end in divorce. So that's uh, better than, uh, than we had, uh, that we had thought. Um, but, um, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about your divorce coach business. So what is a divorce coach? What do they do and what type of people need a divorce coach? All people going through a divorce or people that are going through specific types of divorce? It would be my opinion that all people could use a divorce coach. Um, I can help with many aspects from any point in the divorce process. So a lot of people come to me in the very beginning because they either they have asked for this divorce, but oftentimes it's because they've been, they've been told that their spouse wants a divorce and their whole world is up in, you know, shambles and they are lost. They don't know how to process it and they don't know where to go. And so what I do is I help them find the professionals that they need. So for example, um, I am a firm believer that if you're going through a divorce, if whether it's amicable, whether it's not, whether it starts amicable, whether it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You need a family law lawyer. You need somebody who specializes in family law, um, whether they need at that point a therapist. Um, they so might tell, tell, tell me how a lawyer is different than a coach. I know it's obvious, but tell me. What's the difference so in a lawyer and a coach? A, law a lawyer, first and foremost, is most likely going to be the most expensive divorce professional on your team. Uh, but a lawyer's job is to advise you of your rights and obligations. Your lawyer will, will look at your best interests. Your lawyer will help you understand um, what, you know, the court will look at in terms of what is you know, reasonable, what is appropriate, what is not. So really you should be using your lawyer for advice and strategy on what your legal rights and obligations are. And so the way I've heard it explained is that um, way too many lawyers say people come to me thinking I'm a therapist, a coach and their best friend. And they're saying, if I'm a therapist, coach and a, and a best friend, number one, you're coming to the wrong person. Uh, number two, you're paying too much. And number three, you're not asking me to do the stuff that I'm really good at, which is actually lawyer work. Um, and mm -hmm. so go out and find a, a therapist, coach, or best friend that you can talk to. Don't exactly talk to me. Exactly right. You said that so much more eloquently than I did. Okay. So, <laughs> so then tell me, what is a therapist versus a coach? So a therapist, 
uh, tends to look at how you got to where you are today. So they look at choices that you made in the past. They could look back at, at previous traumas or they look back at the past to how you got to where you are today. As a coach, I don't look at where you've come from. I look at where you are today and how to propel you forward, how to set goals, how to focus on the future. So how do you focus on the future? I encourage my clients to set goals. It could be an exercise that I do with them. Where would you like to be in a year from now? I, I just did this actually the other day with a client. I, I had her write down where what she wants her life to look like in a year from now. And she put a lot of thought and effort into it. And I was actually so impressed with the details she came up with. But from that, it's easier for her to go back with me and set goals in order to get there because now she's got her eye on the horizon, right? She's got her eye on the prize. She knows where she wants to be in a year from now. So I will work with her on how to get there. Um, it sounds like a, a coach that's a coach of, uh, you know, leadership coach or a performance coach. So it's not very different than, uh, than those other types of people that are out uh, selling, uh, providing their coaching services. Is that, is mm -hmm. that the case? It's, it's accurate. I mean, I make my clients, I ask them the questions. I, I ask them the questions and I never give them answers because they're not my answers. They know what they need to do, but I offer them a different perspective on how to look at certain things. So sometimes I will spend a whole session talking to them about how to talk to their children. So if their children come home and say, well, you know, mommy said that you do this okay, what's an appropriate way to react to that? Okay, because to say, well, you know, your mom doesn't know what she's talking about, she's crazy, well, that's not appropriate. So instead of doing that, or that's obviously an extreme case, but instead of doing that, let's come up with scripts and things that you can say to your kids. And so you're not putting your kids in the middle of anything and you're not speaking ill of their parent, but you're still handling the situation in, in an appropriate way. So one of the things I really liked about your website is that you've got a blog and uh, you've got some really interesting articles on your uh, blog. Um, and uh, one of them that I found interesting was three trips to act well when your ex doesn't. How do you act mm -hmm. well when your ex doesn't? You take the high road. So that goes back to what I was referring to when I said, for example, um, you don't have to respond to an email, you know, employ the 24 hour rule. And one of the ways that you can act well when your ex isn't is making that transition, not looking at them as your partner. So making that transition from a life partner to treating them as a co-parenting partner. If a colleague or a coworker sends you an email, you're not going to write back by saying, oh, you always do this. You're so aggressive. You're not going to write that to a coworker. It's not professional. So why would you write it to your co-parenting partner? Okay. You might say that to your spouse, but when you're divorced, you no longer have that luxury to lash out at them. And so keeping that in mind and switching, my new favorite expression is flip the script on how to handle these correspondence is a good way to start acting in an appropriate way. And the other way is you got to do a lot of tongue biting, especially when it comes to things with the kids. So if, you know, an example, and I think I have this example in my book where, you know, the kids can come home and say, well, ugh, why do we have to eat broccoli? Daddy ordered orders pizza and I don't have to eat broccoli at daddy's house. Well, instead of responding by saying, well, your father has no clue about nutritional value, that's not appropriate. So what can you say instead? You can say something like, well, this is how we do it here. How lucky for you that you get to eat pizza at daddy's house. Another uh, one you had that I found interesting was, how to ask for a divorce. How do you, how do you ask for divorce? <laughs> well, uh, and, and truth be told, I wrote that article so long ago. I, I don't remember. I'm sure my four key points are, oh, there we go. Be patient, be clear, but kind. Um, this isn't time for the details and let it sink in. So being clear and kind is probably 
the best tip. Um, and, and it can simply start with, uh, I actually wrote this article for a client who was looking for coaching on how to ask for a divorce. It's interesting that the divorce coaches get involved even before the divorce process has yeah. started. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I like getting involved at that pro at that point before it even happens, because I feel like if they're getting some information on how the process is going to work, it helps them make more informed decisions and helps them set up properly. So even coaching on how to ask for the divorce. I mean, these are, these are strategies, how to tell the kids that mommy and daddy are, are, or daddy and daddy or mommy and mommy are getting divorced. Uh, these are, these are things that it's always better to give thought to and prepare for. I, I just worked with a client last week on how to uh, talk to the kids about the fact that they were separated. And, you know, we came up with a script. We came up with a script together that they were comfortable with, and then they were going to, you know, rehearse it together and, and practice it. So when they told the kids, they were on the same page, they were presenting a united front. What's the biggest challenge that your clients face, do you think? Disengaging from, from uh, what they like to term a narcissistic ex, whether they're really narcissistic or not, I don't know. God, I've heard um, that word so much of late. Everyone's I, I know. throwing around narcissist, narcissist. Like it's right. incredible. It's like the new right. word. It is. It's like bullying, right? It's everyone was bullied and now everyone's a narcissist and maybe the narcissists are being bullied too. I don't know. Um, but it is, it is a, a word that people do throw around. And I don't know if, you know, their, their spouses are actually narcissists or if they, you know, exhibit certain narcissistic behaviors and it's not even my job to know. And it doesn't even matter to my client because again, they can't control it, but what they have to do is control how they react to it and not allow it to get under their skin, not allow it to become all consuming for them and learning how to disengage. That seems to be uh, one of the biggest challenges with a lot of my clients. Heather uh, Tannenbaum is a diverse coach. We're chatting with tonight. If people want to access your services, Heather, uh, what's your website? My website is reconstructinghappy.com. My email is heather at reconstructinghappy.com. And uh, what about your book? Reach me there. How do they? My book uh, can be purchased. The, the best way to purchase my book is on Amazon. Excellent. And is there a uh, audible version as well? I believe there is. Uh, no, there is not. There is an uh, there is an ebook, and there is the the paper version. Excellent. But there is not an audio. I would love to do that though. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments from Heather Tannenbaum, a divorce coach, in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Heather Tannenbaum. She is a divorce coach. She's written a book, How to Use Your Divorce as an Opportunity to Build a Better You. It's called Reconstructing Happy. Her website is reconstructinghappy.com. Uh, and you can get her at that website. Um, and her, uh, her email is heather at reconstructinghappy.com. Uh, and uh, um, I know uh, she would love to hear from you if you, uh, if you need any help. Um, Heather did you use your divorce coach? No, I didn't even know that a divorce coach existed, um, but I really wish that I would have because it would have been really nice to have somebody who wasn't, well, I didn't use my lawyer as, as a friend. Um, I had learned enough from my spouse that I was divorcing that that probably that wasn't a good idea because he, he's a family law lawyer. Um, but it would have been really nice to have somebody who wasn't a friend and who actually was a professional in some capacity to talk these things through and really help me kind of deconstruct what I was feeling and take the emotion out of my decision making. Given your divorce, given your journaling and book writing and given your experience now as a, as a divorce coach, if you had to do it all again differently, what would you do differently, if anything? If I had to do it all again, well, A, I would hire a divorce coach. Um, B, I think that I would not be so worried about what other people thought. I would be more concerned with 
my, how I feel, how my kids feel, which obviously was my primary concern, but I don't think that I'd be worried this, if, if, if I had to do it again, I don't think I would worry what other people thought of it. Who cares what, you know, my neighbors down the street think when the moving truck comes to my door, I, that stuff wouldn't bother me. If you get married again, would you get a prenup? I am married again. I oh. am married again. Did you get a prenup? Is it okay if I don't answer that? Yep. Uh, would you recommend people get prenups? Uh, I do. I would recommend it particularly if there are children involved. Okay. Um, and uh, I presume, given what you've said, that you wouldn't say you wouldn't get married. So getting married wasn't the mistake. It was something in the marriage and something in the divorce. Is that the case? Uh, with myself? Well, I, I'm a different person than I was. I, I was 25 when I got married the first time. And I mean, I'm still 25, but I'm slightly older the second time I got married. In all seriousness, I'm, I was 46 when I got married the second time. You know, if, if I were the same person at 25 that I am at now 47, I'd have bigger problems because that would mean that I hadn't evolved at all and grown up. And, you know, your, your perspective changes over time. You have your own children, you have other things that go on in your life. I lost my father in 2015. That was a turning point for me. Sorry, sorry to hear that. Thank you. That was a turning point for me as well. And forced me to, again, kind of reevaluate some of my choices and some of my, my, um, decisions as I think any any tragedy in your life right. forces you to reevaluate whether that's divorce whether that's death whether it's something else what about kids are there divorce coaches for kids it's a good question there's therapists for kids so I, I actually recommend quite a bit that my clients um, get therapy for their children to help them process everything and to give them a safe space to talk about things that bug them about mommy and daddy without having to talk to mommy and daddy about it. I've had some people tell me that even if you don't think the settlement is fair, divorce is so expensive, it makes sense to settle. What do you think about that? Well, it, 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 it's, there's validity to that. Um, it's always a cost benefit analysis. There was um, a situation a number of weeks ago with a client who um, she had a motion uh, and it was over uh, one point that, that her and her ex-spouse could not agree on. And I, I was on a conference call with her and the lawyer and the lawyer explained, well, how, how important is this to you? Because he's asking you, she didn't want to give up something like $600 annually. So I asked the question, I said, okay, so $600 a year is what you want to save, but how much money is it going to cost you to go to court to tell a judge that you don't that you don't think you should pay that six hundred dollars a year. Well, the answer is it's going to cost significantly more than the six hundred dollars a year. So, and this is where taking the emotion out of it is really helpful because at the end of the day, you have to look at what makes the most sense. And something I said to my lawyer when when I was going through my divorce was, I, I'm sure you're a great guy, but. I'd rather put money into my kid's university than your kid's university. So you also have to look at what are you throwing good money after bad? Are you being penny wise, pound foolish? Or is this really an issue where, I mean, let's say, for example, you are concerned about the safety and well-being of your children when they're with your former spouse. And you feel that it's important that you go after what used to be called sole custody is now sole decision making. That's one of those situations where, yeah, it might be worth it to spend whatever you need to for the safety of your children. So every situation is different and you have to just look at the bigger picture. And is it going to make sense financially? And is it worth it? Sometimes the answer is, yeah, 100% it's worth it. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth sometimes, but at the end of the day, it might be the better decision. It depends on the situation. Heather Tannenbaum, a divorce coach and an author of a book, Reconstructing Happy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling us a little bit about your own journey, about some of your clients' journeys, about your book, and about your divorce coaching business, which you can find at divorce 
at, at reconstructinghappy.com. Uh, and the book uh, as well uh, on Amazon uh, called Reconstructing Happy. Heather Tannenbaum, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, that's our show for tonight. I can uh, be found every night at six o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. You can get all my podcasts and video casts after the fact at briancrumby.com, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, um, and uh, all the podcasts on Audible Podcasts, on Speakeasy, and on uh, Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining me. Good night, everybody. Heather, thanks again. Good night. Thank you.